So um, is this it? Are we expecting more people or is this pretty much it? I know. Uh, we had more that signed up, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be here. So we might as well just get started and they can join. All right. Um, the reason I'm asking, um, did you see my a message to you earlier today, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, right now, um, if it's this many people, we don't need to do a breakout. If we get a couple more, then I'd like to do a breakout. Okay, we have it set up so that we can do breakout. Okay, yeah. All right, I just wanted to make sure you'd seen that. Um, hi, everybody. I think I know everybody. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we'll probably, um, we'll probably do a breakout now um, when we get to it. So hi, Golner. Hi, George. Hi, Bay. Hi, Stephanie. Is there somebody else came in and went out? Who was that? Yeah, hi. This is Wen Zhen. Uh, yeah. Hi, where are you from, Wei Zhen? Uh, I, I currently the Associate Director of Teaching and Learning Assessment at New York University School oh. of Professional Study. Well, great. Well, thanks for joining us. That's great. Yeah, I, I, I thought you were a new face to me, so that's nice. Yeah. Well, welcome to our little our little Zoominar or whatever it is, webinar. I think Zoominar is the new word. I like that even better. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to thank uh, the Trestle folks uh, who um, were part of IUB, Indiana University is part of that, but I want to thank them for uh, asking me to do this because I've been meaning to think about this in a you know, in a serious way ever since I took on my new position as the director of the Center for Learning Analytics and Student Success, and I just haven't had the time. And so this really encouraged me to, to sit down and, and really think about how the work we're doing on our campus with learning analytics could specifically support other projects, both within Trestle and the you know, the Bayview Alliance, and just the idea of course transformations in general, because as we all know, the, uh, you know, we're not the only people involved in course transformations. They're pretty common throughout higher ed in this country and around the world, actually. So this really, you know, this encouraged me to really start thinking about how the work that we're doing could both support and inform that work. So this is pretty exciting for me. I got some new ideas and because they're new ideas, I haven't really had a chance to kick them around with too many people. So I'll, I'll, I'll be really interested to see what you think about them and to get some of your responses to it as we go along. So I guess I'll just start by pulling up my slides, huh, Jeff? Okay, hold on and I'll do that. Maybe all you have to do is hit share your screen on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. So. Everybody can hear me okay, right? I don't need a mic, right? We're good with the computer mic? Okay, good. Hold on and I'll go to it. Ah, okay. Why didn't it work? Uh, hold on, I'll try again. Are you guys still there? Yes. Okay. I don't know why I'm having a hard time sharing this. Just having some issues. Hold on. I don't know why I'm having difficulty. It usually just pops right up and gives me the choice. So just give me a sec. I know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. You guys see my screen now? Okay. There we go. All right, good. Okay, well, um, first just let me introduce myself. I'm the director of the Center for Learning Analytics and Student Success, which is part of uh, the Indiana University's Office of the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. I report directly to the Vice Provost. But also all of my work and everything I do is uh, directly linked to the um, Bloomington Assessment Research Office. Um, they are really the ones that have the expertise in data analysis and data provisioning. And none of the work that I do would be possible without the work that they do. 
The center has got a, a mission that's pretty specific in this world of learning analytics and the world of learning analytics is, is ever expanding and encompasses many, many different things. But in my role, my job is to empower faculty to use learning analytics data in what would be for most people, the scholarship of teaching and learning. So if you know what that is, where faculty look at their students, try to improve student learning in their courses. Uh, what we've done is we've created a program that was modeled after that scholarship of teaching and learning program that I directed for over 10 years. And so now we have this new form of data and a new way of looking at students. And so it's really an exciting time. Um, so when you look at your screen, you see the full slides, right? Yeah, okay, good. So today, uh, what I hope to do is provide this framework I have uh, thought about and developed along with help from other folks. And that framework is, is answering the question of how we can use learning analytics to assist in course transformation initiatives, taking advantage of this new evidence that we have of student learning. And the way, I, the way I think about this is this data, is, the data we have is very large, it's very massive. And so we can think about this evidence of student learning from before, during, and after courses have been redesigned and taught. So that's how I'm, um, that's how I'm building this framework out for us to think about. This is um, some, not all, of our Learning Analytics Fellows to date. Um, we have 40 of them total and some graduate students that may not be in this picture. They come from all walks of academic life, including uh, full-time instructors, tenure track instructors, tenured instructors, graduate students, uh, and basically anyone that's at the university teaching courses um, can be a fellow. And the fellows program, very few people have the expertise of working with big data and advanced statistical analysis, um, with the exception of two people. And that would be uh, this person here, Cotty Bonner, up on the right, and then uh, Ben Motes, who both have, but everybody else, they're just teachers who go about doing their disciplinary studies every day. And now this world of learning analytics is new to them. Um, and the, the basic strategy that we're using is called a top-down, bottom-up, and middle-out strategy. And what that strategy acknowledges is that, and this goes along with the philosophy of the Bayview Alliance, which is that we, as a group, acknowledge that the actual uh, fulcrum for change to take place and be deeply rooted in higher education will only come about if we have faculty engagement and that faculty engagement can then influence the departments and that the departments are where the change really needs to take place. So there's been a number of ways this has been done over the years. This is not a new idea, but we've had, we've used faculty learning communities, we've used communities of practice, communities of transformation, and now this other idea of network improvement communities, which the Bayview Alliance has been involved with. So within the Bayview Alliance, I think almost everybody, with the exception of our, our new colleague from uh, New York, uh, the Bayview Alliance has what are called research action clusters. And each one of those research action clusters is focused on particular solving particular problems within teaching and learning. And uh, we're leading one for, uh, for the Bayview Alliance called the Learning Analytics Research Community. And basically what we're asking people to do is fairly adopt the model that we have on our campus, on their campuses to some degree and test and um, see what differences and similarities we have in terms of getting faculty engaged in using uh, learning analytics data. So uh, the way our program is, when I show my cursor, can you see the cursor? Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is our program right here. And so what we have is we have fellows, which are faculty members. Um, there's usually about 10 of them. Then we have the facilitator, which is the Center for, Innovate, uh, Center for Learning Analytics. Then we have an administrator sitting at the table along with the people that are data experts. And this is our community for any given year. 
And so what we've asked is for the LARC communities to each do one of these similar fellow programs. Some of them have different names. So this is our entire LARC community, and this is an enlargement of the individual communities. And we're using a framework uh, to, our goal is to create a data informed culture in higher education. And what that means, what that would look like is that when faculty and administrators and deans and chairs are sitting around talking about their students, making decisions about their students and this course and that course and curriculum decisions, that rather than using the anecdotal stories that everyone carries around with them about students, some of them true, some of them not true, that instead they look at data that we can now provide them and use that data to inform their decision making. So that's the goal. Um, and the cyclical model that we borrowed from Marco Molinari out at UC Davis, which is one of the uh, collaborating campuses, is this idea of awareness, understanding, action, and reflection. So the first thing is faculty have to become aware that their anecdotal stories are either true or not, oftentimes they're not, then come to an understanding of why that might be the case, and then do something about it, hopefully some form of interventions within a course design or a curricular design, and then reflect on those measurements and impacts. So that's the overall theoretical model that we're using for the learning analytics of fellows programs. So uh, I think it's important to bring up the definition of learning analytics, since it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And uh, depending on what they think it is can mean a whole lot of different things. There's an official definition of it, which comes from the Society for Learning Analytics Research. That's the one that gets mostly quoted, and you can see it's pretty broad and is kind of in technical speak, which is the measurement analysis and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning. <clears throat> Big data is generally referred to, it's not necessarily the size of the data set, although they always tend to be very large, but it more has to do with the complexity of the data sets, where the data sets are coming from, whether those data sets can talk to one another and how you can make sense of those data sets. So those are two terms that are generally sort of officially in the literature. At our institution, learning analytics is the measurement collection and the analysis of data about and with students. Um, and it's for the purpose of improving teaching, learning and student success at the course program and institutional levels. And uh, the definition for student success that we have is students arrive at college ready to do the work. They get and decide on a career in a manner that's not going to affect their graduation and then they graduate within four to six years. So that's that's what we're working on as our overall definitions. So when we start talking about learning analytic data, uh, the, the data sources generally come from about five or six different places. Most of them come from either student information systems, better known as SIS systems, or learning management systems. And the SIS systems, a way to think about this is from the time a student applies to a college or university until many years after they leave that university, they are leaving a digital footprint. Everything they do, every choice they make, every decision they make, every move they make throughout their career is recorded somewhere. And sometimes it's within the data warehouses and sometimes it's within the learning management systems. And then there are other systems too, like student activity systems, and which is mostly about swipe cards. So yes, we could know how, how many times a week a student goes to the gym. We could know that if we wanna know that. And not only that, we can actually know where students are now with these GPS tracking systems. And in fact, there was a learning analytics uh, project done at Purdue University, who's been a pretty much a leader in some parts of this field, where they actually were able to determine how often students were on campus versus off campus, and then look at that. And through their analysis determined students were on campus more or are more likely to graduate on time. So it's that kind of thing. So, so there's a lot of different data coming at us. My work right now is really focused on the student information systems data. 
And that's because we can't seem to make sense and get the right kind of data sets out of the learning management systems yet. We expect that's gonna happen at some point, but right now it's been pretty difficult. So we're part of the Unison initiative. Some of you may be part of that as well. And they're working on that problem separately. And then there's this. So there's ways to think about this analytical data when it comes through and how it might be used. And so the first most basic way to think about the data and the way many of our fellows have been using it up until now, which is fine because we, are, we have a long-term vision and we're working incrementally, is descriptive analytics. And basically descriptive analytics tells you that something has happened to a student or a group of students. Diagnostic analytics tells you or might tell you why it happened Predictive analytics takes the descriptive and diagnostic analytics and tries to predict future outcomes. And then prescriptive analytics is analytic data that will be used not only to predict it, but to prescribe what should be done. And you can see that as you move up this, this uh, the set of steps, the farther up the set of steps you go, the more, not only the more complicated does the process become, but the more ethical questions come about. So if you look at prescriptive analytics, for example, and you think about um, prescribing an action to a student based on uh, a propensity score matching system, which is when you can, you can take a student that almost, or a group of students that almost has the exact same um, profile as a student you're advising, and you can look and you can tell whether that student's going to be really successful in certain courses at certain times in their career. You can tell, you might know by looking at that data that based on that student's, student's profile, they are never going to get into a particular program and succeed. You might know that almost definitively. The question becomes, are you responsible to tell it to that student? And how are you going to tell it to that student? So embroiled in all of this are huge ethical questions that we're just coming to terms with right now because stuff is moving so fast. Here at IUB, we've got, we've been working with faculty. When we first started working with them, we really didn't have um, a whole lot of um, preparation for what was gonna come at us. And the first couple of years were really messy. But over the last four to five years, we discovered that most teachers at this point in what I would call the what is happening part of analytics, most teachers have similar types of questions. And over time, we've been able to filter all this huge data from the SIS systems and come up with what we call dashboards that then can be slightly modified to answer particular questions. And we're calling it the CRAM data dashboard the acronym standing for course retention attributes and majors. So we have these visualization packages in Tableau software where we can look and see and answer questions about courses, answer questions about retention, answer questions about attributes, things like that. So, um, so based on that, um, you can see that there's a lot of things just from the student information systems perspective that we can know about a student. We can know, for example, what student, what, what, what was the student's first choice, oops, excuse me, what was the student's first choice in a major? Did they change majors? How many majors did they change to? When did they change those majors? What does their pathway, a visual pathway look like all the way through their career? We, we can see that now, we can look at that. Um, and then we could ask, well, what type of student did that? What were the attributes that that student had that would be attributed to this, this pathway. So for example, do first generation students who are in our, our scholarship programs have a certain pathway that's more, that can be generalized and which ones of them graduated in a time and which ones of them didn't. So it's that kind of thing. But based on that, what I'd like to do is ask you to, to get together and talk about this question so they're gonna put us in breakout sessions. Is that right, you guys? Anybody there? Yeah, we can break it up into uh, however you want. If you want to split into two, then- How many people we got? 
uh, 14. Including we got 14 your, people here now? Including yourself. Yeah. Uh, so if we can do them in threes. Um, the only thing is there's no way to keep, there's no way for them to see this screen when they're in their breakouts, right? I don't know. Yeah. Don't so anyway, so what I've done is I've outlined sort of the landscape of this, um, of what we're looking at in terms of learning analytics. And my question for you to discuss in your breakout sessions, if I were to hand you this, these data dashboards that have all this information on them right now, and I said, I can get you this data about any course you're either teaching right now or redesigning right now or going to redesign in the future. What questions would you have for me so that I could provide you with the right data? Right. So come up with some questions that would. So and as an example of a question might be, um, uh, how many students in my course are first generation students and how did they do? Right. That might be a question I can answer for you. That's like an example question. So why don't we break out, go for like, what, maybe four minutes, three minutes, and then we'll come back together and see what people come up with. Is that, that clear to everybody what we're doing? Yeah. Three or four is a work fine, whatever is a good number and just put me in one of the groups then. Okay. And, okay. and then just put a clock on and call us back Blair or Jeff. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Everyone will get an invitation to accept. So we can broadcast the message to all. Because <laughs> I don't know if they can still see the chat. I think they can, but all right, two minutes, four minutes. So after like two minutes, let's put a two-minute warning on there that will broadcast everyone. Where are we? What room are we in? In the main room right now. So if we wanted to, I think we could enter a room. Like we can join any of your rooms. We can have fun. Um, but I choose to stay in the middle of because otherwise they expect me to leave the conversation when I hate them. <laughs> so yeah, and like I don't know actually. Let's see. Let's see what they're going to say. Let's see what
feed me. Wow. All right, everybody back? That's right. Well, for those of you that entered after the, you know, these Zoom meetings are really weird because one way they're really weird is, of course, if you're doing this face to face and somebody comes in after you start, you see them. <laughs> you know, they come in, you know, it's like, oh, hi, you're here a little bit late. But in the Zoom meeting, once you open your slides up, people are coming and going and <laughs> you have no idea who's actually in the room with you. So, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, so let's go around and have somebody from at least uh, one of the groups uh, or just, you know, what kind of questions did your group come up with in terms of what you might ask from this data? Find out. Remember, you can also type them into the chat box. It's a bit easier. Okay. So I'm waiting for somebody to say something. Okay, I'll start. Um, Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> some of the things we talked about was looking at uh, gender and underrepresented minority status, especially in terms of why certain students drop out of certain majors. Um, uh -huh. Also, sort of the pathways to different courses. You know, what are the prerequisites? What seems to work in terms of preparing students for the next course sequence so you can recommend things. Um, we also then uh, diverged into a kind of a question about um, how you're able to have so much access at your university um, because none of us have that kind of access here at our universities. So yeah. maybe that's something you'll talk about later. Um, yeah. Well, actually, to, the, to, to a greater degree, well, we can talk about it after you get finished with this part. You know, when I well, you save that for the final part of this when we call everybody back after I show a few more slides. But yeah, yeah, that's that's the that's the literally million dollar question. <laughs> Who else wants to share? Wei Jun, what do you guys talk about? Oh, okay. Yes, actually, in my uh, section, I think uh, one of uh, the member in our group talk about like um, he wants to know how many times students spent on a certain activity and how many times students um, like basically the way that how students interact with uh, the course material. Uh, 
And then I expand that uh, a little bit to ask the question about like, uh, I want to know about my students prior, prior knowledge. For example, before they come into this course, what are some of the courses they have taken? And then um, what do they bring in into my course? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, what I'm gonna do is uh, go back to my slides now for a few minutes. Um, so, uh, here's the framework I'm thinking of, and it, you'll see, I, I think you all have, so this is the idea I have, and I think you, you've kind of validated this for me by the kinds of questions you're asking, and it's kind of based on my experience thus far. But, you know, if you think about your course, and there's certain things that are going on during the course and there are certain things that are upstream and there are certain things that are downstream from your course. And I think we can sort of overall frame the kinds of questions somebody would ask within this kind of uh, idea. And so upstream, you know, we have questions that are similar to some of the ones brought up, which are, who are the students taking my course? Where did they come from? How did they perform in related courses? And that would especially be true for prerequisite courses. Um, there, you might have questions about um, um, prediction. Uh, so you know certain students are coming from other courses and there are certain types of students that are coming from other courses. Can you predict how well they'll do in your course? Based on other information you might get out of the data, are there interventions that would help them do better? One of the big projects we're doing here, we just got an AAU mini grant for, has to do with um, something called grade surprise. And grade surprise happens is the differential between the grade a student expects in a STEM course versus the average of all their other courses grades, an average of the GPA for all other courses, courses. And that differential is a great surprise differential. And it's very common in STEM courses for students, high achieving students, even students that have done really well in high school, they get in their first large STEM course and there's a great surprise. So the project we're working on, we, we've determined there is a great surprise, we that great surprise, even across um, uh, gender differences and ethnicities. And the question now in front of the group that's working on that is, can we create some interventions that will then help us um, to work through that grade surprise and reduce it so that students will remain in the major? George, are, are you trying to share slides right now? Because yeah, I am sharing slides. You're not seeing them? Nope. There's the. Oh, oh, it probably bumped us out when we were in the group. So yeah, you're not you. you're not seeing the framework. Oh, that's terrible. Thanks for interrupting. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at my slides and all right, we'll try again. Here. Thanks for interrupting. So anyway, let me go back here and start over. So here's the framework. The idea of the framework is you have things that are happening before, during, and after your class. And I'm just going to whip through this. So here, upstream questions who are students. How are they performing? This is where I was at when you pointed out you weren't seeing my slides. Can I predict how well certain types of students will do? Can I create interventions? That's the great surprise project I was talking about. And then um, during the class, you can have you can actually do comparisons of how well students are performing in your class compared to students in past courses. Um, if, you if you have that data, um, we have one project where somebody has that data. Um, you could be measuring whether interventions are helping students. And then, you know, the, the other key part, which is really very useful is, okay, how well did they perform after my class that was transformed and somebody had this question? compared to the original course or other courses. And of course we can do regression models and remove all kinds of factors to, to uh, uh, make the questions more uh, precise. And then um, finally, you know, the big question is, you know, in the other courses that they're taking, especially in their major, how are they doing? And that was Stephanie's question, which is a really great, great question because we're doing all this work 
to transform these courses and we really don't actually know if it's making a difference or not. Um, and, and of course, the big question is, do they remain in the program or the major? And this is especially true for STEM um, because we have a STEM problem. We're not, we're not educating enough students in STEM. They're not receiving the degrees and we really need to be figuring out how to do that. So, um, so and I'll just, I'll just tell you, uh, other than the great surprise, I'll, I'll just tell you one other story. So another story about this is, um, just to show you what happened. So we had a, a project here. Uh, the, the, the teacher teaches an accounting class. It's in a professional program. And uh, it's, a, it's an upper level course. They have prereqs. And she was convinced that the problem was that the course, that the grade, that the performance the students did in the prereq course was the reason, that was the influence of how well students did in her accounting course. That was her hypothesis. Well, when she looked at the data, what she actually found out was that the, um, it wasn't the grade they got in the prerequisite course. And this will come as no surprise, but it was a surprise to her. It was how long ago they took that course. So if they had taken that course right before her course, the students did much better than if they'd taken it two, three, four semesters before. So then she had to come up with an intervention for that. And since it wasn't necessarily a, a, a skill related problem, what she's come up with, my understanding is she's creating like two, many tutorials that so the students can go back to those projects from the other class. Anyway, that's just one example. So, oh, hi, Mary. Hi, sorry to be so late. Oh, uh, you missed everything. I'm just getting ready to say questions. <laughs> questions okay. concerns. I'll have to run it by you again sometime. I'm really interested. Uh, I'm, you know, this is a, I started out the talk by saying that, um, you know, this was really great to be asked to do this because I've been wanting to think about and sort of formalize my thoughts about this for a couple of years. And this gave me an idea to kind of shape it. So just so you know, what, what I've got here is this framework of thinking about where a course is situated in the stream and the, yeah. kinds, of, the kinds of questions we can ask. Um, oh, I see. I, I get it. Yeah. 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 Based on what, but, you know, these are the kinds of things we can answer now that were very difficult to answer before. And so um, we did a little breakout where people came up with questions and then, you know, and then we looked at the slide and people had questions very similar to this. And of course, the one of the one of the big ones in terms of the work we're doing with BVA would be the one over here in the, the total right hand corner, which is did that course transformation class really make any difference in the long run? That's what that question is asking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so do students stay in the program? Do they do better? Does it really make a difference when we're looking at the student success? So anyway, uh, I'll leave that up there. And, and but the, what I'd like to do now is just hear other people's ideas, their suggestions, uh, questions, but I'll leave that up there. So as a prompt, so. Is this when we get to ask how you got access to all this data? Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm wondering who's on still. I've only got a couple people on my screen. Is that because I'm- that There are 15 people. I know, I don't see everybody. I don't see hardly anybody. Look under the participants. Look. Yeah. I'm okay. still here. All right. Just most people have their video off is all. Oh, uh, okay, that's what it is. You can all right. scroll through. Yeah, yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I think it was Caroline that was Carolyn. I can't see your name anymore, so. There was somebody had asked about getting access to the data. And, um, you know, that is really a contextual question, which has to do with every institution and how they're maintaining this data and how transparent they're willing to be with it. Um, many schools, this would be with your institutional research office, more than likely, or the folks that are handling your learning management systems. And those, that's where you're going to get most of your data and how you're going to work with them is going to be really based on the context in which you're working in. 
I'm just very fortunate that I, the vice provost for undergraduate education um, is a data expert himself, but also is very well versed in undergraduate education and transformed learning experiences. And so um, he's been able to actually create his own miniature institutional research office to get this data out of the, the bigger warehouses. That's how we have solved the problem. Uh, at KU, they're solving the problem a little bit differently. At KU, they're, um, they're working with their institutional research uh, community and that office, and they're providing resources. They're trying to provide resources where somebody can get the data. And so that's another way to think about it. But this is one of the problems we're trying to solve with the Research Action Cluster and Learning Analytics is seeing how different uh, institutions actually um, wrangle this data, get access to this data, share this data with faculty. For us, the other major hurdle is how, how is it that faculty can see all this data? Like how can you make that argument for the IRB and for your, your data stewards? Well, the way we do it is our argument is every one of these projects that faculty are involved with, each and every one of them are um, for institutional improvement. And so whenever you make the argument that you're improving the institution, you're more likely to be able to get to this data. Now, whether you can share that data publicly or not becomes another kind of argument you have to make the IRB. But what we did with that is we sat down with the data stewards and we sat down with the IRB and we said, you know, let's make this work. The IRB folks helped us write the language. So we have a template, we give it to the faculty, they submit it to IRB and IRB is seeing their own language. <laughs> you know? so, it's like, oh, we already wrote that. <laughs> that you know, and then if they have a certain concern, then we deal with it. So now, for example, and we're always pushing the boundaries, and we have to keep pushing the boundaries and making these people who haven't had to do this work think about it differently. So, for example, one of our fellows wants to study students with disabilities and how well they've done in their program versus other programs. We have not been able to get that data yet. Uh, we've been working on it for almost six months. They just don't want to, they don't want to, they don't want us to know that for some reason, which is crazy, especially since most of the students with disability, they actually um, self-identified to the instructors to get special treatment. So the instructors already kind of know who these students are. But so anyway, it's one of these FERPA things and they're just really being cautious. And so, you know, it's, we're always going to be pushing the boundaries on this last year. Uh, institutional research folks have their own organization for professional development, their own journals, and there was an article published by somebody that's been in IR for over 20 years, and it was basically the bottom line of the article is we have to change the way we do business. We're no longer going to be able to say no. We're no longer going to be able to say we'll write that report for you. We're going to actually have to figure out ways to provide this data to people. So it's happening, you know. And George, uh, is that IRB? Um, form uh, available that, that can, you helped write? I can certainly make it available. There's nothing, it's not, you know, it's just language. We can certainly share that with people that are interested. That might be good. Yeah, sure. I, I would I would definitely be interested in seeing some of that language myself. Uh, we're actually, um, we, I work with the Office of Digital Learning at Everly College of Science at Penn State, and we're collaborating with the College of Arts and Architecture to build a, a course management system, so to speak, that uh, is primarily like web components based. But without getting too techy, we're uh, also uh, collecting data on a per course basis or looking to collect data on a per course basis. So each course would have its own individualized learning locker, so to speak, where uh, with, you know, we use APIs, so to, uh, for example, like YouTube, when you watch a YouTube video, there's different APIs you can access to gain access to information like uh, how many, uh, at times a student press play or how far they got in a video before they they switched and so forth yeah. so uh, to see some of that IRB training because like on the tech side we have it all pretty much knocked down but on the logistics side like going through the university um, and with IRB and the risk assessment and whatnot it'd be interesting to see some of the language you all put together to get the university to cooperate so to speak. Oh, so where are you at again Charles? Uh, Penn State. Yeah Penn State. Are you guys part of Unison? No, no. What's your LMS system? Uh, actually, we're building it right now. It's a, it's a 
it's called Hacks CMS. So oh. it's a con it's a content management system. Um, it's right now a lot of LMSs are like you know Canvas and yep. um, there's some you, you get into problems where a faculty member uh, it's like a one box fits all for for instructors right and so you might want to have an instructor that wants something unique and they have to go to this forum and yeah. and put their request in and hopefully the Canvas people get to it and so we've kind yep. of uh, removed the middleman and we started building this this platform called hacks in collaboration with the college of arts and architecture um and basically it leverages all the browser specs and, and things like that so there is no middleman and we can uh take what like services anything like youtube that has an api or if canvas has an api or anything like that if we can get access to those apis we can plug them into our our custom lms yeah. so to speak yeah so one of the interesting things, if you look at the framework, you know, you're right in the middle. You're thinking about things that are happening during the class, right? Yep. Yeah, That's like how, how students specifically interact with content. Right. Yeah. So what, what, what the, the bigger data affords you is doing with the, you know, being able to compare those activities with how students might have done in a class that didn't have those activities. Too. Absolutely. That kind of thing. So, you know, that connection can still be made. You can still look upstream, even though the course might be different, but it'd be a different data set. But one of the things I found out about Canvas, where I have discovered about Canvas, it's most fascinating. It was supposed to be the latest, greatest thing, you know, it was going to take, make use of everything, all the social media and all this, which it does. And it's a much better system than the system we have, believe me. But it's not set up to get data out of it. Precisely. That's exactly why we're exploring. Yeah. And it's like, if this was going to be the next greatest thing for the 21st century, they didn't even anticipate people were going to want to bring the data out. It's really amazing. But meanwhile, they sold a lot of them. So. The vendor life, uh, the vendor process is strong for sure. But I absolutely 100% agree. That's, I mean, that's why we've invested so much time exploring this alternative because yeah. Like you said, Canvas was a step in the right direction, but it's still one box and yeah. not every instructor is going to teach the same way. They're going to need different services inside their box to deliver the content yeah. how they see best. Yeah. So what else? What, does anybody have any other observations or questions or? Yeah, uh, um, George, I, I would also like to uh, learn more about how you work through the IRB process because here uh, at NYU, um, learning analytics is quite, uh, we're still like at the beginning phase. So the way we're doing it is we tie it with uh, scholarship of teaching and learning. And that way we um, get faculty spy in and then we would have faculty to work uh, to engage in this data use and data conversation and share it with more um, faculty mm -hmm. and because this this learning analytic practice to me uh, is like uh, informative assessment it's new and then I think people need to take time to think about how to use this tool effectively mm -hmm. and then but again uh, we we, we have some faculty start using it and um, in amazing ways. And then it's just, uh, we ha we're having a hard time to have people to share the yeah. results and or, sh or even share the models because we don't have the IRB approved yeah. before we started. So yeah. I would love to learn more about that. Sure, yeah. Um, well, one thing we can do um, is I can just, send Blair the Blair and Jeff the template and they can just pass it around to the people who signed up. So everybody signed up, I assume. So we'll just do that. That's one thing. The other thing is we're uh, really excited about this work and um, this, you know, in terms of helping people uh, get access to the data or doing this work, we're more than uh, willing to help out any way we can. We're willing to visit campuses. Uh, my vice provost is willing to talk to other vice provosts and provosts and we really we really think this is really important work and so you know we we keep telling people you know let us know if we can help in any way we do have a summit uh, each year this is our second year and that summit's coming up next week um, uh, we're kind of maxed out so um, but uh, it's April 3rd to April 5th and it's specifically about um, engaging faculty in learning analytics work and so if any of you want to come out still i'll just you know 
I'll just bypass the system, but you know, it's getting kind of late. So, um, but we do have that every year. And that's also for anybody that it, it's, so if you go to other learning analytics conferences, you'll see the field is huge. There's a lot of things going on and we are really focused on this one aspect of it. And that's the community we're trying to build through the Bayview Alliance with the LARC community, as well as um, the uh, larger community. So, so the other thing I can do for anybody here, if, uh, if you want to let me know, I can, we have a learning analytics listserv, student learning analytics listserv. I can add your name to that. It's not real active, but it is where people are having these conversations. So maybe you might want to find out how other people are dealing with their IRD. That'd be a great question to put out there, Asian, and you could see what, you know, does it, how have other people been doing this? You know, and we could get that conversation going too. Definitely. Please yeah. sign me up. Okay. Golnar? Yeah, I have a question about, can you speak a little bit about the kinds of expertise you need on campus to be able to engage these kinds of projects? Yeah, so, um, yeah, you need a lot of expertise that I don't have. <laughs> so, because there's a lot of experts involved. So one of the things about this is, it's one of the, I consider it to be one of the strengths of doing this work, which is you really do have to form a community on your campus and, and have people collaborate and talk across units. And what that does is if in the end, so if in the end what you're really trying to do is pr improve student success, it brings people to the table who normally don't even have that, you know, it's not even on their radar, but suddenly it's like, oh yeah, we never thought about that part of this whole thing, which is the ultimately the mission of everybody's school, but everybody's so siloed that you know, they're busy doing their job without thinking about the larger scope of what we're doing for students. So um, you definitely need to get your, you definitely need to have your, what we call data stewards involved in this conversation because they're the ones who ultimately have the keys to the door where the data is behind it. So they have to be informed and understand what you're trying to do. And a lot of this is totally new to them and they're dealing with a lot of state and federal regulations and privacy rules and their work they're doing is very important. You need some statisticians who can do really advanced statistical work, um, regression models being one of them. There's some other statistical models out there. Propensity score matching is another one. Um, so, you know, a lot of our faculty don't have those skill sets. So then we have to match them with people who do have their skill sets or they have to hire somebody because we give them grants. So one of my fellows who actually is in the humanities, uh, Jennifer Robinson, you know, she, she could just about move around in a spreadsheet when she started this project. So she used her money to hire a graduate student who had expertise in, in running those statistical models and interpreting the data for Jennifer. So you need that. And then you need people who can actually manage and filter the data. Um, so, you know, in other words, they might give you the data. So the first year we did this, we just had all this raw data and we gave it to the faculty and they were, they were inundated, had no idea what to do with it. The problem is not enough data. The problem is there's too much data once you ask for it. And, and so you have to filter that data and shape it and have it make sense. So having people that can work with uh, tools that do that, in our case, we're using Tableau, which is also a visualization tool. So, you know, those are the three big components and then, of course, to make that happen, you're going to have to have administrative support because this is going to take time and money away from other things people are going to do. So you have to have leadership on board, and then you have to have these other offices that are willing or interested to collaborate together. And then for us, the, the additional most important ingredient is having the faculty work on their scholarship with it, which way you're already doing that part. So, you know, and that's the engagement part that's the most exciting. When you, when you see how faculty have a shift in how they view their courses within, you know, even though, even though they know, if you look at this framework, they know all this is out there, but they've never been able to really think about connecting it. You know, it was, it, they might've had the question, but then they would just shrug their shoulders and say, well, there's no way I can find that out. So all I can do is ask my students, what grade did you get in the last class? Or how well are you, you know, it's now, one we know. now we know, so or we can know, I should say you can know. Yeah. So I think we're up at the 12 o'clock part, right? One o'clock my time. Where's my, um, Jeff or Blair, what do you want to do? 
Anybody there? Yeah, sorry, I was uh, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. I, yeah. uh, so right now, because people were requesting some documents, I uh, was setting up an email for, the, uh, for all of our participants so that if you forward me any of the documents that they've requested, I can make sure it gets out to everyone. Okay. Um, but then basically ready, whenever you're ready to wrap up, if people are ready to wrap up, then you just let me know. Yeah, but we said we'd go to one, right? Yep, that was the time slot. Yeah, so I just wanted to end by thanking you all for inviting me again <clears throat> and letting anyone know that if you have my email, put it out there, Jeff. If anybody wants to email me, I'm always happy to work with people. It's really exciting. I keep meeting new people every day from all over the country and all over the world that want to do this work. It's totally a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's uh, the metaphor I like to use is it's the wild, wild west. We're building the train tracks while we're riding on the train. It's, you know, but all we know is we're headed to this new frontier. It's a lot of fun. Um, and also, I, I'm going to be giving a talk at this uh, in late April at this convention called the Smart Campus. And it's actually in uh, Philadelphia, Charles. And they have told me that they have some uh, passes that they're willing to waive conference fees. I think the conference fee is like $540. So if anybody wants, is or wants to go to a smart campus, look, I think it's called Smart Campus East. I'll actually put the link in the information that we're going to send out. If anybody wants a free pass, I guess they have some. <laughs> so, awesome. I'll definitely look into that. Thank you. It might be fun. Yeah. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'd like to stop on time, you know, since people have other plans. So I'll, I'll just turn it over to you then, Jeff. Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for uh, joining and uh, I'll have George send me the documents and uh, I had a question about uh, the recording. So I know that uh, I had a lot of glitches on the audio, uh, which I think is, has to do with KU's internet. Um, so we did do a recording. So Zoom actually will compress all the files for that and we will upload it to the Trestle website after Zoom sends it to us probably in a day or so. Or, well, yeah. next week anyway. We, well, that we will let everybody else in the B Bayview Alliance know, too. Yeah, so we will be uploading the recording. Yeah. Hopefully, Zoom has a better recording than some of the audio that we dealt with on this. So, um, okay. I guess that's from now. And George, send me the documents uh, that people were interested in, and I can forward those out to all of our participants. Okay. All right. Well, it's nice meeting everybody. Like I say, stay in touch. Have a good day. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you.